Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you to our Matin service for this seventh Sunday after the Pentecost. We continue to grow into the gifts of Christ and rejoice in His ministry among us. For those of you who joined us online, if you want to get a copy of the bulletins, you can go to our webpage, www.calvarypeoria.org. Look under the media, and you'll see where you can download that all in the service. For the rest of you all, if you take time to fill out one of the registration cards, drop that off in the offering thing, and we do part of your teacher help with that. And now, as we're still being safe, everyone wave at the night of the past the days. We begin with our opening. Thank you. 
forgives you all your sins. As a called ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
down before we get to the gospel. So today we're going to be in Luke chapter 11. And a disciple will ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And Jesus starts out in a rather obvious but surprising way for them. He says, start out by saying, Father. And the reason that that's important is because up until that time, people thought they had to impress God as the most exalted, holy, one, or the most magnificent king of the universe, and all that flowery language. And they thought they had to convince God of stuff that he might not do otherwise if they didn't get the prayer just right. But Jesus says, no. Remember first, his father. And, and let his name be holy, and let his kingdom come, and let him give us what we need for this day. We you know the Lord's Prayer, and we've been through it in catechism long enough. So we know that prayer. We say it all the time. But starting with the word father is what is key here for understanding who God is for us and how it is that we're going to Talk to him. And then Jesus goes on and he says, Look, you know, if you knock, it's going to be open to you. If you ask, you're going to be given. If you seek, you will find, because God's not trying to hide stuff from you. And if you want to think about a weak example, think about how human fathers who love their kids treat them. If a child asks for a fish, dad doesn't give him a snake, does he? Right? If he says, Oh, can I have an egg for him? He says, No, here, have a scorpion. If he says, can I have some bread? Ah, here, have a walk, right? And, and Jesus says, well, you know, if you human fathers know how to give your children good things, how much more so is it with your Father in heaven? So you don't have to convince God. You don't have to try and put on a big show for God. You just need to talk. And God already knows what you need. And God, because he is good, wants to give you what is good. And that all begins as he pours out the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus gets to the gospel this morning, Remember that he's teaching us how to pray not with the words that we have to say or the techniques that we have to use, but with remember first and foremost, who it is we are talking to? Our Father, who is in heaven. I'm going to go on with the rest of the service. First reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death, the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I am the dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five. Again, he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty have happened there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again with this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way. When he finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Here ends the reading, O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second reading continues from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the second chapter. 
Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See that no one takes you captivity by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all the world authority. In him, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh. But the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up with reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Here is the reading. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the gospel first. Hallelujah. I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Now and it will be open to you. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke is recorded in the 11th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place when he finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And this is John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you has a friend? We'll go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, let me three loaves. A friend of mine has arrived on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and do not bother me. The doors now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you that he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impotence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, his son asks for a fish, will instead of the fish give him the serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, give him the scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ.
And so I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, when you pray, say, Father, how will be your name? So, in a quite Lutheran way, what we need to avoid here is turning Jesus' teaching about prayer into a list of instructions for us to follow. Or if we do that, we can change the lovely gospel here into a steam pile of law, and we dare not do that. But the temptation is there, and Jesus knows it. And that's why he is at pains to get the disciples to understand the Father correctly. For when we actually begin to get what our Father in heaven is about, prayer begins to come rather naturally. Yeah, let me back up. So, with Jesus' teaching us the Lord's Prayer, there are two things that need to be front and center. First, understanding who we are praying to. And second, understanding what we are given to pray for. And we can be here all day to address both of those fully. And I urge you, don't go over you, your small catechism was on the Lord's Prayer, to refresh your understanding of what it is that we pray for. I want to begin with who we pray to and how we need to understand the nature of prayer. Now, Lutherans, if polls are to be believed, often claim that they feel at a bit of a loss in knowing how to pray. We have all these really great written prayers, but it seems like we've been buffaloed by the culture at large to think that spontaneous prayers from the heart are the real supercharged prayers, whereas just reading some prepared prayer. Let me suggest that that's one of the first and deepest confusions that we've inherited about prayer, and specifically, that's what Jesus is trying to address here. Because of the fall, because of sin, because of our old nature's fear of God, we sometimes approach prayer as a matter of trying to huck God into something that he is otherwise disinclined to do. Or we can turn prayer into a kind of bargaining session along the lines of what Abraham did regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. But notice, this assumes a kind of adversarial role toward God. I have to convince him. I have to be really sincere and heart about it. I have to offer something to show that I'm really serious. It all presumes that if we don't step up properly, God will rightly respond. You call that a prayer? Good luck with that. Or if another image helps, we worry that our prayers are kind of like grand prayers. And that if we don't do it right, if we don't have a good enough case, we're going to get turned down. One of Jesus' disciples asked the Lord to teach them how to pray. He was likely seeking the words, the techniques that would guarantee a positive response from the Most Holy One. And Jesus' response is breathtaking in a way that doesn't often strike us because we're so used to repeating these words. When you pray, say the Father. Don't start with, oh, most high, most almighty, holy one, king of the universe, master of the stars, and container, container of all. I mean, all that is true. And using those titles for God can help us remind that nothing is beyond us. But to approach God thinking that we need to butter him up with fancy words, this is the point. In Christ, by taking our humanity to himself, by taking our part in the battle against sin and death, God shows himself to be our loving Father who wants, of his own character, the good for us. That's what fathers want for the children they love. They want the good for them. And this is Jesus' point in the teaching that he gives. If we human fathers, as messed up as we are by the fall and by sin and shame and fear and anger and so on, if we still generally know enough, love enough, to give our children good, or so with God. Which means that prayer is not a bargaining session with the divine being who needs to be convinced to hear you. It is talking with your heavenly Father in Christ about the things that concern you, about the needs that plague you, the fears that dog you, and so on. You don't have to put on a show. You don't have to use super special words. You don't have to go on for hours. You simply come to God as your Father who loves you, who wants what is good for you, who has promised you love and grace in the blood of Jesus, his Son. Father, hallowed or holy be your name. Now, Luther's quite right to know that God's name is already holy all by itself. It doesn't need our help to make it more holy. Rather, here we are asking that we, that is you and me, that we would treat his name as the holy and precious thing it is, rather than neglecting it or using it like some common thing. To be holy here means to be set apart for the use that God has given it. 
period. God has given his name, Yahweh, Jesus, has given us his name first and foremost so that we can call upon him. And we get the importance of that, right? It's one thing to say to him, but hey, you, could you let me a hand? And then quite another say, Bob, oh, would you let me a hand? God has given us his name to call. And he's given his name to bless. To bless in God's name is to place good upon a person, upon a circumstance, according to the authority and the will of God. We do not bless lightly. But when we are given to do so in God's name, we bless with the confidence that God will indeed do righteously and bring forth the good. He has also given his name to use in his power and his will to preach and teach. Now, while it is painfully obvious, it doesn't hurt to be reminded, to remind ourselves that as we preach, as we teach in the name of God, we do so only according to his truth, his revelation, and his power. But when we do speak in his name, he does what is most wondrous. He himself speaks. To preach and teach in the name of the Lord is to dare to speak his word. And again, that's why we approach the word with reverence and awe. For it is the word of the living God, spoken to us here, now, in his name. Now we could go on, as I mentioned earlier, we could go all day and not exhaust the content of the words that Jesus gives us in this prayer. So we begin with speaking to God, to God, our God, our Father, with awe for the name that he has given us to bear and to use. And then you notice he also gives us to pray for our daily bread. Now the phrase is a curious one. It gets translated in a variety of ways. I'm currently like the unfolding of it right now that emphasizes the bread that we need for this day. Because of course, we don't just want bread for the day, right? We want bread and shelter and clothing and funds and etc. for the foreseeable future. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to make sure that you are secure against the changes and chances of this life so long as you understand one thing. You can't eat tomorrow's bread today. Now that doesn't mean that you can't gorge yourself today so that you won't have leftovers tomorrow. Of course you can waste your resources so that you can find yourself in trouble when the chips are down. But the phrase, you can't eat tomorrow's bread today, wants to point you into a deeper direction. Nothing you do today is going to relieve you of the needs that you're going to have tomorrow. Sleep all you want tonight, and tomorrow you'll still need to sleep all over. Share love and companionship with all that you are worth today, and what will you still need and want tomorrow? Love and companionship. Eat the finest dinner this evening, and what will your stomach tell you come in the morning? We can only live one day at a time. We can't live tomorrow or next week or next year ahead of time. You might say, well, so? So what do you actually need from your father? What's necessary for this day? Now, he doesn't begrudge you the days to come, but there's a call to contentment here. When you have what you need for the day, for this day, then rejoice. And know that your father has seen to it that it is so. And, and then, remember that if you took care of it yesterday as well, and the day before that, and the day before that, what can you expect tomorrow? It turns out with your Father in heaven, past performance is a guarantee of future faithfulness. And finally, we recognize in this prayer that we live by God's mercy and grace for us in Christ, which means that we are called to be gracious and merciful. We are forgiven so that we can forgive. One of the things we reflect on in these Sundays after the Pentecost is our call to bear Christ, to carry Jesus to others in our own lives. Baptized into Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and been made dwelling places of his spirit, fed with his body and blood, we carry him with us into all our very college, whether at home, here at church, out in the public square, so that through us, he might continue to touch and heal others and gather them to his Father. So let us pray, and trusting our Father and his love for us, in Jesus the Son, let us live as we pray. God grant it. Amen.
And now we have peace that surpasses all understanding, guarding hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the glorious day is appear. Amen. We continue with the today. Your mercies are new to us every morning. 
and who abundantly provide for our wants of body and soul. Give us, we humbly pray, your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and cheerfully serve you. Amen. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us, and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord.
French stability made the hope all who are struggling with this economy, plus the people of Hades, they struggle to recover and establish a stable civil life, French shelter and protection to all refugees, especially those displaced by the conflict in Syria. Finally, we ask that you send your spirit of peace to Somalia, Myanmar, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Nagorno Karabakh, the Middle East, especially Israel, Gaza, Iraq, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, and all the places torn by the war or civil strife. O oh Lord, in your mercy. In your heart, pray. We also ask that while our nation continues to live with peril while many remain in harm's way, that you would watch over us and show your mercy to all who are in danger or who suffer in any way. Comfort those who mourn, heal those who are injured, give wisdom and humility to those in authority. Continue to be with Garrett Foote, Josh Rousseau, Gallup, so that was at Bauer, Zeke, Garrison, and all deployed in active duty military personnel and their families. Protect all innocent civilians everywhere, bring them justice that them are righteous and lead all to repent and heal and seek your peace. We know that all things are in your hands, Father. We ask that you would bring justice and establish fair government according to your good and perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have saved the cross from the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings be ordered by your governments may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.